Hey everybody, this is Jeremy, and this week Dave has been under the weather, and I am pretty wiped out from having to dig myself out of the nor'easter that just blew through my area over the last 16 hours or so and dumped over a foot of snow. So we're not going to be doing a new show this week, but we didn't want to leave you guys hanging like we have unfortunately done in the past. So this week we're just going to give you a classic episode. This is from about a year ago. It is our interview with Jeffrey Tucker. It was back when Danilo was still on the show and we were still using Skype. So the sound quality may be a little off from what we've been putting out lately. So I do apologize in advance for that. But overall, this was a really fun conversation to have. So for those of you who haven't caught this one yet, I hope you enjoy it. And we will be back next week with a new episode. So thanks for listening and have a good one. Peace. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. And I said the only way I would ever go back is if, like, they just flat out cure cancer, 100%. Like, there's no way you can die from tobacco use. Uh, no, I'll go back to I dipping because I, lo- I miss they, it that much. causes cancer these days. Well, you know, it doesn't I, really matter. I quit smoking, like, a year and a month ago. And I got to tell you, okay, look, I highly recommend smoking for all young people. I think like, <laughs> like, teenagers should smoke because that's when you're Kids Can we attention. get some warning? Can I get some warning stuff flashing up? <laughs> Not actual advice. It, it is slavery. It's just a different name. A lot of people don't realize it, what it is. And when we bring these ideas to light and make people realize, you know, that this government force uh, is, is the problem. Oh, and it, and it, to me, it's like I, I, I say, imagine you're an abolitionist in the 19th century and and the, the slave masters are giving you the same exact argument who's gonna pick the cotton hey seeds of liberty read the show's description please fervently complete the course reporting to the infantry finish him deconstruct the fallacy season all production means it seems to spawn a tragedy repeat the action please a fraction of the allegory corollary cadence is complaining on a sadder story menial recently reading into the thesis here yeah, mirroring the people who completely fail to see it though Hello, everybody, and welcome to Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 47. We're going to go with Jeremy for the Bipcot no Gov license. Yes, as always, the Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the Bipcot no government license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at bipcot.org. So today we have uh, Jeffrey Tucker, volunteer anarchist, uh, founder of Liberty.me. Uh, the uh, the recent um, um, I guess it's new social networking site for um, and and also you know to place to post uh, articles and such for uh, liberty minded people and he's also the director of the foundation of economic education so uh, Jeffrey thanks a lot for coming on the show oh it's good to be here I like that license thing that was kind of interesting I haven't even heard of that how come I haven't heard of that that's crazy uh, it's it's relatively new the uh, the creator uh, well one of the creators and uh, of the Freedom Fiends uh, radio show and podcast kind of came up with it um, it's kind of a take off of the creative creative commons well but I mean um, it's awesome because you know government now for like 500 years has tried to implement these restrictions on information you're, flows. You're killing me, Jeff. That's my favorite dip of all time, and I'm an ex-dipper. I'm an ex-dipper, okay? You're kill. You're killing me here. <laughs> It's like it's like it's like uh, it's like when if like uh, you know it's like uh, when you you're flipping through the porno mag and you see something you really really like and you're just like ah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. D- Dave and his ADD. Wait a, wait a, wait Sorry, a that's all. I mean, it was like a, it was like a bolt of lightning. I was like, that's <laughs> skull mint. That's my favorite no, dip of all time. And isn't it funny how people get attached to their own dips, right? So it's weird. You go to the convenience store and they've got like eighty of them. You're like, ah, mm-hmm. you know, but you find one you like and you get attached to it. So mm-hmm. sometimes they won't have skull long cut mint. So I'll go. 
Duke. <laughs> Have you got, I don't know, wintergreen, you know? And they're oh, like, I can't do yeah. wintergreen. And, and then they get it, and you're just disappointed. You know, you just, <laughs> you just, you just can't quite adapt to it, you know? So people get stuck on their own thing. And I have other friends of mine who are like, I can't believe you use Skull. I would never chew anything but Copenhagen. I'm like, I hate Copenhagen. I, I was a Copenhagen so, purist for a long time, and, but still my favorite flavor of dip is Skull Mint. If it, 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 you know. It's so weird. I quit dipping about four years ago, and I said the only way I would ever go back is if, like, they just flat out cure cancer, 100%. Like, there's no way you can die from tobacco use. Uh, yeah, I'll go back to I dipping because I, I miss it that much. causes cancer these days. Well, you know, it doesn't I quit, really matter. I quit smoking, like, a year and a month ago, and I got to tell you, okay, look. I highly recommend smoking for all young people. I think, I think <laughs> for all young like, people. teenagers should smoke because that's when you're. Kids can we get attention. some warning? Can I get some warning stuff flashing up? Not actual advice. I'll I'll I'll, I'll put it I'll put a ticker warning before the show. We'll be fine. A ticker warning. Okay. <laughs> no, it's so like why, why waste your youth without smoking? I mean, that's the time to smoke. I smoked smoke since I was fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> because you know when you get older you know you just you can't handle the smoking as nearly as much and it starts to take a toll so that then you stop all right and life's happy it's good but i probably probably waited too long uh because when i stopped smoking weird stuff started happening to me like um like my hair started growing yeah you know, i started being able to taste food my teeth got a little wider and i started like vegetables and like, <laughs> you know, i mean weird so like i cut Side myself effects. <laughs> yeah you cut myself out of heel faster you know it's like everything so it was really one of the best decisions. But look, I'm, I when I say that, I'm not recommending to anybody under the age of thirty that they stop smoking. Smoke as long as you possibly can, but at some point, just know that you probably have to quit. It's sad, but true. Uh, well, I still like is, a good cigar is. every so often, but I think I've pretty much kicked tobacco. I, I vape, but. I'm just a, a nicotine junkie. I'm a nicotine addict. I don't feel right if I don't have it. My my mother and father were around smokers and smoked and all that. It's just it's just in my body. There's a reason it caught on in the Middle Ages, and it's a kind of a sign of modernity. I mean, you know, like primitive man didn't have these things. And, uh, uh, I mean, Europe didn't really experience tobacco until, what, like the high Middle Ages, something like that? Well, it, it was until yeah, trade routes from Cuba and South uh Exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. And then Europe became like a happy place to live. You, you want to you know? hear a, a cool story about the first guy that brought a cigar back to uh, to uh, Italy, I believe it was, or Spain? Tell me. I mean, what year would that have been? Like, Am I right? Like, it was like 13-something, 13, 14-something, 13, oh. okay? So he yeah, brings it back, and he goes, he goes, King, 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 I got something to show you. He lights it up. They all mob attack him think he's been possessed by the devil, throw him in a dungeon for six months, and he has to appeal to the king for six months straight that he can prove that he's not a witch. <laughs> that was the first time tobacco was brought to the, to the, to the Europe. That is so interesting. I mean, I left out names in, in much more detail, but I heard that on uh, somewhere or someplace. <laughs> I heard that somewhere, someplace. It sounds good, so I'll just run with it, Dave. Goes with the rise of the the early years of capitalism, and you know, and and also with you know expanded life, you know, you know expanded um, life lifespans, and with the the end of feudalism. You know the origin of money. Uh, modernity began to get you know sort of blossom. Yeah, you know, it would take a few more hundred years before we saw you know the Black Death end end and that sort of thing. But so, no, the tobacco, tobacco, and and living the good life are just kind of like that. So you know, if you're not if you're not chewing or dipping or something at the at the age, by the age of twenty, something's gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it def I mean, it, I mean, you're right. It, it's been a huge part of culture. I mean, it, I mean, it was used as mu it was used as you know currency for a long time. So it's always it's been a big part of mo you oh, know most right. cultures for but, as soon way, as as soon as it came there, it became a part of the culture and you know. Do you, do you know about hookah? I mean, what, like, what is it? Is it? Well, I is mean, I, I've I've smoked out of one before. That's as well, much as I know about them. <laughs> some places it's hash, and if you if you don't know what hash is, it's basically the pollen off of marijuana plants. Mm. And some place they smoke like a hash. It's called a hashish or sheesh, and mm. it's uh it's uh heavily compressed, and pushed down, and packed down tobacco that you just burn for hours. Yeah, and, yeah. I, mean, uh, I like I just don't know if it's bad for me or not. Well, uh, she, uh, she, uh, the tobacco is really bad for you, but the, well, no, no, you know, no, obviously no, no, no. the. 
Uh, see, I, I would have to disagree because I'm, I mean, I'm here in New York where we've had, you know, out on Long Island, we've had hookah lounges. I think most of them are shut down at this point, but they were because of the laws here. Um, they were straight tobacco hookah lounges. And, you know, for me, I mean, I, I've joked about this in the past, but it, it's, it's kind of true. Like there was a point in my life where I rolled my own cigarettes. And though, I mean, I mean, yes, there are. You know, there is you get tar in your lungs from smoking, yada, yada, yada. But the majority of like carcinogens and all the all the bad stuff about cigarettes is because the the way they process them and the stuff they use when you're when you're taking straight tobacco, when you're taking like, you know, clean tobacco leaves and, and getting and stripping it down like that. It's not as bad for you. So when you're smoking the more pure stuff like that, like the stuff they use for the hookah, it's not it's not that processed junk that they shove in I cigarettes. Right. And you know, even like I mean, and cigarettes are even you know they they dig, they degrade pretty quickly too because you have like a company like uh, who who is it? Uh, Philip Morris who has uh, uh, Marlboro. I you, forget all this stuff. You know, I was um, I, I was thinking the other day about the tobacco industry. And, and and since we're on the topic, it just I was, it really didn't make sense to me why they weren't the people like really pushing a lot of cancer research for lung and throat stuff because it would make logical sense that they could keep more customers if they cured the lung cancer and throat cancer problem. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, and you would well, think I, that they would be economically incentivized to say, "Hey, look, yeah, smoking's bad for you, but it doesn't give you cancer anymore." But I think, isn't it true that a, they've, a lot of the innovations that have come out of the cigarette industry have actually been good, like like filters, for example? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, so, yeah the, it, it cuts down, but it's, you know, the, the filters, as far as I know, really only cut down on the on the tar, on the tar that gets through and the you I know, used to smoke the, Camel unfilters. That's the only cigarettes and, I yeah, smoked. Yeah, I, I smoked Lucky Strikes. Unfiltered. Yeah, I, I yeah, Camel uh, filters. But look, it's crazy. The <laughs> it's my favorite thing. So crazy, like this one says, this product can cause you know horrible things happen. But uh, <laughs> another typical warning uh, that you say on these things is this is not a safe alternative to to cigarettes. Okay, nothing is safe. Probably not blueberries and celery. They're probably <laughs> not safe either. But you know the Bad question films. is, is it is it as bad? And the answer is that no, it's nowhere near as bad. It's actually a really good substitute for smoking. So why you know? But the government is lying to us. I'm mean, not that anybody believes it, but you know what I mean. It's just offensive. Oh, dip, dipping. They say something stu so stupid. I mean, obviously, well, I'm way better off with a little bit of this in my. Well, mouth I mean, it, I, all right. Let's let's just boil this down. Can you live without your mouth? Yes. Can you live without your lungs? No. Well, uh, that's a yeah. really good point. Right. No, that's, uh, yeah, that's right. And that plus, a disturbing I think the visual. Incident, <laughs> the incidence of mouth cancer in this thing are so ridiculously low, and well, and. Yeah. I mean, it's really true even with cigarettes because there's something like one in a ten chance that a cigarette smoker will 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 get cancer, uh, and it's only you know I mean the, I think the chances of anybody getting cancer is something like one in thirty, so it's not that much of a difference. But my point is that when I quit smoking, I discovered all kinds of weird benefits I didn't expect, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and if better. somebody had explained to me 10 years earlier, okay, um, you'll get far less bronchitis, your hair will look better, your eyes will be bluer, your teeth will be whiter, your skin will be fresher, um, your diet will become more varied, you know, and uh, your fingernails will be harder. I mean, all these kind of weird things like that, which is all of which is true. I looked up every one of those things I just said, by the way. It's all true. But mm -hmm. it's not advertised. The only thing they talk about is the worst possible uh, uh, effects of smoking, which is cancer, and it's also the one that many people are just like looking at the statistics and they're thinking like, "I like smoking. I think I'll take the risk." You know? Well, yeah, it's, but that's yeah, well, true. Well, the, the the reason, I mean, just like anything else, it's 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 you know, it's fear mongering. That's why they go for the they try to go for the kill with the ultimate. Well, it's cancer, it's cancer. But just like you said, anybody, you know, my one of my one of my favorite comedy bits of all time was one. I I think it was uh, Dennis Leary from back in the I guess early mid '90s or whatever. Um, but he had a bit on smoking, and it was just it was the you know he was talking about the you know the warning labels and everything, and it basically came down to you know you could be, you could put a a black skull and crossbones. On the fr on the front of the pack, and it could read, "This will kill," not may, whatever. No, this will kill you probably tomorrow. And smokers would still line up around the block because oh, most smokers. But like I, Jeffrey was but saying, but actually, you know, smoking's on such a rapid decline at this it, point. It is, they're saying but, it's going to go the way of the dodo. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, in like poorer places, smoking's going to be always around. 
Yeah, I think, yeah. Because, I think because of vaping, it might, it, it might, it might, it might switch over. But just in general, like most uh, most hardcore smokers, like Jeffrey said, they they look at the they look at the numbers that are presented and they're like, eh, it's all right. Because no, I mean, that I was mean, my opinion for a long time. I was a smoker for, I started when I was thirteen, stopped when I was twenty seven, stupidly started again when I was thirty two, and eight, eight years, nine years, seven years later, I'm still smoking. Um, but you know, but I, I it's true. Have you, have you ever been to Australia? I mean, it's hilarious what goes on in it. So in Australia, like every pack of cigarettes you buy, it's got a picture of like a black lung on it, you know, or, <laughs> you know, some infested, you know, heart thing or some bull, some bloody scene of or whatever. And they rotate these images and there's about eight or nine of them. And uh, truly, uh, they don't deter anybody. But instead, people collect them and <laughs> put them in like art and put them on their walls. I mean, <laughs> the, you know, it hasn't done anything. I mean, what's reduced the incidence of smoking a lot has been... Uh, until Obamacare was uh, uh, insurers, private insurers, because if you smoked, your premiums would go like way up, you know? And that's kind of a market-based, a reasonable system of disincentivizing you from doing shitty things to your body, basically. And I, I totally approve of that. I mean, it's like, okay, you're gonna smoke, but you gotta pay an extra 200 bucks a month for your health insurance. I mean, that's a good, you know, pricing well, system. Well, I mean, that was when, when insurance was, wasn't mandatory, you know? Well, yeah, since well, since Der Leader has determined uh, insurance is <laughs> mandatory, uh, the story is a little different now. We're all you paying know, for smokers first, no matter what. I mean, it's hard to like name one of the worst. I mean, I don't think Obama was the worst president I imagined he, he, he would be. But, you know, uh, the foreign wars, of course, are terrible. I'm sorry that it's terrible. But he's actually probably better than anybody's going to replace him. But Obamacare really was an egregious uh, uh, imposition and it's 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 just the the fallout has been awful from it. Yeah, for for the longest time, I thought he was the one that implemented the most executive orders. Like when I started getting into volunteerism, and then somebody pointed out, no, actually, by far, no. <laughs> FDR. Like, when you look at FDR, like holy crap, that guy was like every day and a half an executive order. <laughs> God, isn't that something? I didn't know that. That's yeah. really well. Incredible. Actually, I read something the other day that said the um, what what gets stuffed into each one of Obama's executive orders puts him at like way above even FDR. And Bush is the only one second behind Obama on what they get done actually with an executive order. So like FDR's executive order would be like to free this prisoner or to set up this thing or, you know, he didn't just want to sit around and wait for because it was wartime. You know, they gave him wartime powers to uh, do stuff. So he was making executive yeah. orders every day. So the thing is, America ha hasn't been out of war ever. So, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, like certainly not in the last 15 years. Yeah. No, then, you, then you look at the amount of uh, you know money that's been printed <laughs> under you know under Bush and then under Obama, it's just he far eclipsed any other oh. you know, president like going all the decades, you know centuries. <laughs> but I I still had the profound sense when I watched his last State of the Union address, where he's sort of pleading on behalf of you know nonviolent criminals in prison, calling for prison reform and. Sort of urging caution on, uh, you know, invading countries as ground troops. You know, in the case of ISIS and so on. I mean, it generally sort of came across as like a little bit more of a humanitarian than maybe you know others. And I just had a profound sense. I thought, oh my God, you know, whatever comes next is going to be worse. And it's a terrifying thought that that somebody in the lineup of uh, the two main parties right now is going to be our ruler a year from today. Mm. I mean, and I don't even know. I mean, I don't know. Have you guys thought about this? Like, who are you going to root for? I mean, maybe it doesn't matter, but I mean, it really comes down to, you know, to, to Cruz versus Hillary. What ha you know, what happens? Well, I mean, what Cruz happens? is pushing a, what, a 10% flat tax. I mean, if I'm, I'm taking a pragmatic approach to this, if, if you are a taxpayer, 10% is uh, about as low as you're going to get flat rate. And that's a, uh, a lot of billionaires aren't going to like that either. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not making a pragmatic case for Ted Cruz in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So please don't ridicule me or yell no, no, at me I on Facebook. I, mean, I, I think in the end, libertarians probably will go for the Republican, and that's probably the right thing. Um, but it's it's just it's just a uh, it's just a, a, a an awful prospect. I mean, these guys like Marco Rubio, for example. I mean. You know, there's aspects of him I like, but, you know, it's hard to forget. In the in a, a debate, maybe it wasn't the most recent one, but the one before. He was a male stripper. Is, he was a male stripper? Yeah, I've what? seen the pictures. <laughs> oh. I think Dave's just making stuff. I'm not, I'm not joking. Marco Rubio is a male stripper or was a male stripper at some point. 
They That's got a picture of him dressed up in a Chippendales and everything. It's not a joke. Don't joke, okay. Dave. You seen him? I live. saw the picture. I was you on the live. anti-media radio the other day, and they were Are talking sure about it. Dave was. Are you sure they didn't just take a picture, a picture yes. of me, and put his head on it? <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, Jeff. Perhaps. <laughs> Well, the, it was I a mean, little fuzzy. The picture, I really he, couldn't he, tell. He, too even much. even if he, even if that's true, I don't think that really matters. I don't really think that. Hey, you know what? I I love making baseless cl- claims. So, <laughs> well, Rubio's. <laughs> it's it's pro- fun. I, I, I know you do. Uh, I just don't want you getting <laughs> us in trouble. <laughs> uh, get yourself in trouble, darling. Oh, we're gonna get uh, droned because I called him a, a male stripper. <laughs> Sorry, Jeffrey. It was president. nice knowing you. <laughs> if he becomes president, you never know. Um, Ooh, well, as my, much my, shit I mean, as I'm talking about Trump, I, I hope he doesn't get. <laughs> I'll no, be, I'll be gone. Like Trump, I think the Trump b- bubble has been popped actually as a result of Iowa. I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I he's just, pulling forty percent like in is, New Hampshire. So I don't know. What? He's pulling forty percent in New Hampshire. So. And yeah, and he might, might, might Sanders might is up thirty one in New Hampshire right now. I have this weird sense that Trump is just sort of a confidence sort of game, you know, and and uh, that uh, that things are going to start changing. The betting odds have plummeted. I mean, he went from like fifty two percent to like thirteen in like three days. It's just mm-hmm. incredible. Um, but now I was going to say about Rubio. You know, when he when the subject of Ed Snowden came up, mm-hmm. he said that man should be extradited and tried and jailed. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Ed Snowden's like this awesome whistleblower who I, was only revealing what the government was doing to all the people. You know, I mean, this guy should be brought home and celebrated as a national hero. He should be on the, he should be his vice presidential candidate. He did commit know? treason to the United States government, not to the United States people, but to the United States government. He's a treasonous person. Yeah, I guess that's I mean, when you, when you step outside of the corporation and, <laughs> and say something about it, they don't like it. So... Yeah, I, uh, but it, but it's a proof that it's a, a kind of a wicked power power elite cartel, really, that anybody would think Ed Snowden is a criminal and should be jailed. You know, I I just I can't believe a person like that's going to be president. Well, but they all believe this. Well, that's what I was going to say. Was there even Rand wanted to bring him for the for at least for the most part wanted to bring him back and try him, didn't he? Yeah, I mean. I think yeah, he, I, I thought I think he, I think he softened on that at, at one point, but still, like none of none of all of them, every every single person running for president, want, at the very least, even if even yeah. I, I'm sure even the libertarian candidates wanted him to come back and because they thought he could be vindicated. Yeah, I, I, I had this is... argument. I had this argument with somebody the other day, and I said that's insane. Only only a crazy person would walk back into that situation when you are. The information that you're accused of divulging directly impacts the, the the entity that's going to be trying you. You would have to be a complete moron to walk into that. That's like that's that's asking for you. That's a my that's happy a ass will stay in Russia until the apocalypse. Exactly. So any any of them that said anybody who wasn't straight up, no, I would tell them to stay away. <laughs> so he's in Russia. I mean, what? I mean, look. I, I know this means moth- nothing to you guys, but uh, like I, the world I grew up in, <laughs> Russia was like this totalitarian, demonic devil, you know, and represented everything we we don't want to be because we were for freedom. And mm-hmm. now here it is, the guy who like reveals the truth and is like in favor of you know, um, you know, b- basic standards of of uh, transparency and things on surveillance techniques, and he has to escape to Russia, which is his sanctuary from the evil empire that wants to imprison him. I mean, well, you know, I mean he's a political could... tool at that point. That's a, that, he was, yeah. Putin picks him up as a political tool, not to make a political uh-huh. message, but to see if he can get more out of the American, you know, yeah, uh, that, probably. yeah. yeah hey, co- but yeah, I'm, come on over, but I'm you got to tell me everything you know, or I'm going to throw you to the American CIA. <laughs> That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. You know, Why wouldn't he do that? Putin's not an idiot. No, he runs a, a very large nation. Yeah, he does. You know, look, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything about Russian culture. I do know that I appear, and maybe I'm a tool too, but I appear in Russia today like once a week, probably. <laughs> so, you know, and and they're always nice to me. They ask me questions about Bitcoin, and I don't know, just every subject you can possibly imagine: the stock market, monetary policy, whatever. And um, I, I really like Russia today. And people tell me, oh. You know, look, that's Putin's uh, uh, channel. You know, how can he do that? On the other hand, they have no problem going on the BBC, you know. Um, so or the, I just C- or the CBC. Think... Or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or the CBC, yeah. Like, 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 it's any, like it's any less 
propagandist than any other corporate owned media like people need to wake up to the to that i, I just it's shocking how much libertarian uh content russia today puts out and how libertarian russia is becoming i mean vladimir putin just legalized private ownership of guns <laughs> i wouldn't really? i wouldn't say it's becoming libertarian but <laughs> yes he said look we can't police all of russia we just we don't have the people so y'all go get a gun and protect yourselves that's interesting because Russia is the worst has the worst crime in in Europe. Well, that's interesting. Well, you know, and and speaking of of gun ownership, I thought it was fascinating that I mean, like, if you regard Trump as sort of a uh, following the the fascist script, in this respect, he really departs from it because he actually has said awesome things about gun ownership. I mean, that's the one aspect of Trump that I just think is like, you go, you know, because. He's actually told the truth about all these mass shootings and everything that they take place in gun-free zones. I mean, he's, he's actually been like really solid on the gun issue, don't you think? I I think he's. I mean, from what I've heard from him, I don't. I mean, I, I tend not to pay attention to these things unless unless I have to for a show or something. Because yeah, yeah. to me, to me, it's all just the, it's all just the same. Even Trump. I mean, yes, he may depart from the norm, I guess, a little bit. But when it comes to him, I, I'm still not convinced. You know that. You know, like you were saying before, there's pretty, you know, his the odds seem to be plummeting for him. I, I never really thought there was a chance. And if 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 he Ooh. did get in, it would be because he actually is the establishment establishment person that a lot of people think he is. Or you think we're that far gone? <sighs> you know what? Because honestly, I, I I look back. I mean, I'm not. I, I mean, I it, from the from the political landscape that I've seen. You know, I'm almost forty now. In the years that I've seen. It just every, the progression has continued, and it, it never seems to matter who gets in. Yeah, they all go back on what they say, no matter what they promise. So, like even with somebody like Trump, like to me, I mean, he's so good at saying what he knows his base wants to hear. Yeah, he's, right. he, I mean, he, he's a he's a salesman. That's yeah. what he is. Yeah, he yeah, he, he has been selling himself for like decades now. That's yeah. what he does. He's but good at what he does. Fascinating. I mean, here's a guy who says, look, I'm going to get this. I'm, gonna, I'm going to take charge. I'm going to make America great. We're going to sit down and solve all, the, all your problems. And, I mean, one of the things that's weirdly sad to me about the fact that he probably won't be the nominee, much less president, is we don't get to watch this experiment take place. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating thing. Let's say you actually had somebody in power who really challenged the deep state. You know, who really set out and said, all right, what, you know, we're going to figure out what the hell's going on in this government thing and, and, uh, and like, solve Does problems. it leave the Oval Office on fear of death? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really know what happened. <laughs> I, I don't not... think it can be fixed, Jeffrey. I think it's way past no, gone. I, 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 I think that's think. right. But, I mean, how would the deep state respond in a case like that? I mean, they'd I mean, shoot him in Dallas during a parade. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And I, and I, but, you know, somebody like that might also, I mean, I have these fantasies, you know, not that I would. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just summed up what it is. It's a fantasy. Yeah, but what if somebody actually got elected who actually had an intention to reform and said, you know, after a month, oh, my God, American people, you have no idea. You know, you think you're electing our leaders. You're not. Our leaders are two million strong, none of whom you have elected at all. This is an impenetrable bureaucracy of lifetime employees. They're operating on a, on a legal code that, that dates back 125 years. Well, I'm just here to pitch this stuff to you. <laughs> that's my job, so they tell me. But guess what? That's not what I was elected to do. I'm not really interested in that. So I'm here to tell you the truth. This government is completely out of your control, and it's out of my control. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot more beneath the surface than you think. You think you live in a democracy? You elect elect zero point zero zero one percent of the people who are actually running your lives. It's a it's, right. this is an illusion, my friends. It's an illusion. If you want freedom, you're gonna have to deal with something much bigger than who <laughs> is a president, who's your senator. This is this is all a distraction. 
These are I say I say there's nothing you can do if, if if you're still thinking that you can vote for freedom, your mind is still in chains. No, I, 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 don't, I don't think that was the point though, Dave. I, I, I get what you I get what you're saying though, but I, I think I normally I normally I, I normally just brush off Dave when he makes his assassination uh, accusations about a potential libertarian presidents. Um, but w if if somebody came out a month oh. later and said the things that you're saying. I think that that's when it would happen. <laughs> They're not because well, as soon know, as somebody I, stood up, I don't think I don't. I mean, actually, I shouldn't say that because it's it's one of those it's one of those positions where like, if you believe if you take the, the like the JFK conspiracy to the to the ultimate what what's what a lot of people think is the ultimate conclusion. If you take it there and you say, okay, well, how were they able to get away with it then? Well, because you didn't have the internet, so it would be a lot harder to get away with stuff, but. I, I or did they, they come up with some disease that the guy has all of a sudden that he has to he has to leave let's, or he's let's been throw you out of power. I mean, look what happened to Khrushchev, right? I mean, he came to power as a Soviet prime minister in what, like nineteen what fifty two or something like that, and he was, he was yeah he was a successor to like Stalin, I guess, mm -hmm. and he really set out to reform the system, you know, and uh, he was uh, setting his advisors to get because there anything you can do that makes this economy work, and. He was actually trying to reform the system, and he said at some point in his, uh, I think it may have been more or less publicly to the Politburo or something, that he said, look, this government is out of control. To try to control it, I, I feel like I'm just trying to shape a tub full of dough. Okay, that's what he said. <laughs> so here you have the, the most powerful man in the Kremlin, and he's frustrated that there's, he feels like there's nothing he can do. A tub full of dough. Okay. <laughs> so he keeps like pounding on it and pounding on it and pounding on it. And it doesn't work. The bureaucrats are running everything. And at some point, he's dislodged from power. And I just, you know, you think about the end of Khrushchev's life. I mean, here he was, and the Soviet prime minister, the most powerful guy in the Kremlin, running, you know, the global communist conspiracy. At the end of his life, while still in his right mind, he's dislodged, replaced by who? I can't remember. But, you know, he he's, he's lived, he spent his days on a park bench feeding pigeons, right? <laughs> so, you know, so if you're the, the dictator of a communist country and you ultimately find that you have no power at all, I mean, what's it like, actually, in fact? I mean, does anybody know? What's it like to be president of the United States? I mean, is it just day in and day out press conferences and, and meeting foreign dignitaries and, and greeting Boy Scouts and shit like that? Or do you actually, you know, or do you actually have any decision? I don't know. I don't well, know. And if we could get at least one honest presidential memoir, it would be helpful, you know, to find out what it's like to actually yeah. run. Well, well, They're well, probably I, sworn I, to secrecy. <laughs> Well, I think it it, uh, it vacillates between that that person who's that politician who's honest and says I can't do anything, and the other the other end is the is the guy who says you know I'm gonna you know everyone's gonna get mandatory health care you know we're gonna everyone's gonna you know have you know this this kind of education is you know so complete heavy handed megalomaniac type you know thinking everyone's like a chess pawn and can be manipulated as pieces you know without without the idea of free will and then everyone's a unique individual and uh i don't know maybe they they truly believe that and i mean again it's a politician you never know when they're lying right so i don't know i mean you know? i get the sense you know? that it's all a, a vast sort of pr exercise sometimes you know i lived in alexandria virginia my next door neighbors were uh these two guys who were very high ranking economists at the department of labor they were basically responsible for putting out the unemployment numbers and they were highly trained and they had lifetime jobs and they went into the Department of Labor every single day. I mean, they, they were sort of the guts of the deep state. You know, they're, they're the sort of, they didn't work for the IRS or the State Department of the NSA, but they were big shots in a major, very powerful bureaucracy. And I would try to talk to them about politics and they would always act like, why do you keep bringing up this topic? Because, like, we don't know anything about that. And it's not even slightly interesting to us. I mean, they might as well have been talking to me about, you know, Baltimore Orioles in their last season. I don't know anything about that. I mean, they didn't know anything about it, and nor did they even care. It was like, who was the president? Who was the head of the Department of Labor? Didn't matter to them. I mean, it was just like a portrait on the wall, you know? I mean, their lives didn't change. You know, they, they, these career bureaucrats, they learned to just ignore you know, all this stuff that's dished out to us for public consumption. 
Well, well, of course, because aside from the you know the the few um, lifetime senators, um, they outlast pretty much everybody. They outlast every other politician. They, they see they see all you know. I'm sure I'm sure many of them at the beginning may have cared. They may have gotten in and say, oh, I have to pay attention to this. And after you realize after like the first two cycles go through and there's all these new people in power, they're like. But I'm still here. I'm still getting whatever. paid. Um, okay, whatever. And exactly, yeah. they, they have no they have no reason to care because nothing ever changes. Because what I mean, and most of them came from are working for agencies that usually started in some type of quote unquote emergency that was never supposed to be around. I mean, what's that? Was is it a Reagan quarters of the you know the 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 only thing? Um, there's Milton, nothing more permanent. Yeah. Nothing more permanent than a than Milton a, Friedman. A, I think. Was it Friedman? Yeah, yeah Friedman. Yeah, nothing yeah. more permanent than a temporary uh, yeah. government program. Government agency. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, bureaucracy, because that's what it is. And exactly, they don't have to care. You know, it's like the so, people. You know, people complain about the DMV. Why do you think all the? Because they don't have to be happy. They're just getting paid. <laughs> they sit there all day. They just want to go home. Right. It's a joke to them, and they and they begin. They get immune to it. And they become cynical to it. So what's Trump going to do? Walk into the Department of Labor, fling in the front doors, and yell up 20 floors? Everybody, shape up! <laughs> I what? I mean, I mean, that's going to do, you know, it's it's ridiculous. The whole thing Government is- can't Kate, create jobs if, if, if Trump... Uh, I don't even want to talk about Trump. Trump, Trump. I don't think Trump's going to win. I, you, no, government can't I mean, create jobs, and any Republican that believes that government can create jobs is a not a, they're not even worth their salt as a republican much less I mean, a logical the, the real, thinker i mean my question is like what does the chief executive actually do i really don't <laughs> know the answer to that question i mean go ahead i mean what what if it's hillary clinton you know i i don't even know i mean uh, uh, obama you know promised seven years ago to close guantanamo Mm-hmm. You know, and it's still just ongoing. You know, I mean, and you think that would be an easy thing to take? I think Forget you get black bagged. <laughs> I think you get black bagged, right? Like as soon as you become high ranking in anything, they black bag you. Say, hey, look, this is what's really going on. If you ever well, say anything about say- it. And, and, then, maybe, and then they show you the assassination of JFK. But maybe <laughs> right? they don't do that. Maybe what they say is shut the fuck up and get out there and give a press conference. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the prime minister from Kazakhstan's waiting in the lock <laughs> or whatever. You know. <laughs> I mean, they they really don't have any power when it comes down to it. Like, I want to know what's going on in like uh, backroom Fed meetings. I don't know. I mean, I I wish I, you know, look, I've studied this all my life. I still don't entirely understand how government works. I, I I just, I don't, I don't know why government wakes up in the morning and, and (laughs) what it does at work. I really just, I, 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 the, the workings of it are just continued to be a mystery. I don't know why things happen. Part of the problem is it's so big and so diffuse and lives such a long life, you know? I'm like, we were talking about Ed Snowden earlier, right? I mean, mm-hmm. wasn't he prosecuted under a law passed in like 1912 or something? I think I mean, one of them, yes. <laughs> yeah. The so what, Act or something. Yeah, yeah. Why is that law still around? Why, why, why is that still hanging? Well, why? I guess nobody has an eraser in government. <laughs> like every law. <laughs> so but, because you're it. supposed to be complicit with the atrocities that your government does. The ignorance of the law is no excuse. <laughs> so, but look, a law passed when my great great grandfather was alive. <laughs> is still controlling us today. So we're being ruled by by people dead for three generations. I mean, what is this? I was like, there's no starting over. It's just an endless. Imagine trying to write computer code like this, right? You write code, <laughs> then you just write more code and more code, and you never delete any code. I mean, your <laughs> software is not going to work. Right? That's government. You know, it's just. We, we, we just need one more law. We just need one more law, Jeffrey, and then <laughs> utopia will have been reached. <laughs> one more, just but but if we just save one kid, just one more. <laughs> well, it's the whole it's, people it's, have this view that we could just elect the right guy, then it's going to be like awesome, you know. And it's like I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really know what the president does. I know he can probably or she can probably make it worse in some way. <laughs> I, let me just tell you, for example. Um, I we used to be friends with Jack Kemp, who was this guy, mm-hmm. very interesting guy. He was a, I don't know, he was like a big shot in the Reagan era, and he was like vice president or something for a while, or nominee. Actually, was he? Vice? He was a nominee. I, th- I don't think. That, yeah, he was a nominee. Yeah. And then, and then, and then he got appointed uh, director of HUD, 
HUD, mm -hmm. which is this big brutalist architecture structure called the Housing and Urban Development, right, in, in Washington. And they run like housing in America, some I mean, public housing and I don't know what. So he became the head of HUD and he's like, oh, awesome. I'm going to implement new programs that privatize housing, that um, empower the poor to own their places, you know, and so they can sell them and buy them and, and that sort of thing. And he had these big ideological dreams, you know, born of Cato uh, Institute and Heritage Foundation and went in there, got his office and got his staff of five people or whatever, and his title. And, you know, the portraits on all the walls and HUD were changed. No longer this guy, now this new guy. Okay, now he's like, fuck, now my first day on the job, what am I going to do? And what he discovered very quickly was that the, he could not change anything about the existing structure, but he could make a difference if he got new budget allocations. So if he could get Congress to allocate more more money to HUD, then he could earmark that for his own projects. Mm -hmm. And then he could appoint new bureaucrats to implement his program. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm down with that. I mean, whatever. So he starts scraping around money and you know, fishes up money. He's like persuading congressmen, lobbying people, and he has to get industry involved and everything. Well, so this guy, Jack, my friend, you know, becomes the head of HUD where the budget balloons as never before. I mean, he was <laughs> personally responsible for increasing uh, the HUD budget as it had never been increased since like the 1930s, you know? Mm -hmm. The end of result of which was that he got something like 250 or 300 new employees um, uh, hired to implement a couple of laws that he somehow shoved through Congress, you know, which had regulations or whatever. And this lasted like three years and he never completed his job and then he left and the, the new president came along and that was the end of his... So... I mean, it was like a calamity. I mean, the end result of his libertarian reformist impulses were to make HUD larger, more expansive, more bureaucratic, and, and more imposing than ever, even though he had every intention of doing the opposite. So there you go. That's my story. Well, <laughs> well that, that makes sense, though, because, I mean, that's, yeah. what they, that's, what, that's what they essentially do. That they, 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 somebody, like him, somebody like him gets in, and then... They, it doesn't even have to be like the nefarious stuff, like you know that we, we were joking about before with the black bag and stuff. You just bribe them. You say, yeah, you yeah. can't do anything, but if you want to, listen, we love your ideas, love them, love them. They're great. <laughs> Here's what you got to do. <laughs> you got to get Congress to give you some more money, and then you can run wild. So the per exactly what you said. He thinks, okay, great. This is how I do it. Not yeah. thinking that, okay, now from then on out, now this is the new benchmark. So the right. next year comes around, oh, sorry, all this stuff's already allocated. You want to do this project? Listen, great, we love it. Sounds awesome. This is what you got to do. You got to go down to Congress, and you got to get them give you a little bit more money. And that's how all these programs expand. I mean, that's like all the Reaganites that still can't see that, you know, for all the talk and all the bluster and all the, you know, um, free markets, yada, yada, yada. The explosion in, the, in all the government spending and everything started with him. He was the one who, I mean, if you're going to believe the government numbers, he's the one who brought it over, a, 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 what was it, the, the trillion, the first, the first trillion? I think he was the first, no, no, the first billion, wasn't he? Wasn't who? it something crazy like that? I, it was a billion when it hit him. And who? Then it just Reagan? Reagan. Was it a billion yeah. or a trillion? It was, I think it it was, was a, a trillion. Billion. No, it was a billion. Yeah, yeah it was a billion. I think it was a billion when Reagan took over, and he doubled it, or right. tri almost tripled it. And then well, you had to, his little thing. You had to print money to pay for thing. the Cold War. But, exa but exactly, for all the talk, that's exactly what happens because Look, that's how they get you. A lot of money to cut, cut the government. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's very expensive. Cause, but it's built that way. It's built so that they can write these ridiculous laws, add these regulations, build onto the bureaucracy without, with, with, with just the snap of the fingers. But the red tape to reverse the process... Yeah, you, you're better. You're better off trying to read War and Peace at least five times in a row while hanging upside down. I mean, it's like insane. There's no like most people would just give up and say, "Yeah, I'm not even." There's nothing I can do, and well, then they yeah, leave. It's never, it's never been done. I mean, look, how often does it happen in the 20th century? How often was government actually cut? Okay, so we got rid of prohibition. That was awesome, but that was because government wanted to make money on selling liquor. Okay, mm -hmm. but that's still cool. That was good. Um, under the Clinton years, the 55 mile an hour speed limit, you know, became sort of liberalized to 75. That was kind of awesome. I don't even understand how that happened. What else? 
Um, Reagan cut taxes in 82, but then, you know, increased the payroll tax like two yeah. years later. Yeah. So, I mean, God, I have, you know, under Obama, some good things have happened. Like, okay, to give the devil his due, right? I mean, he didn't stop states from liberalizing marijuana laws, you know, in Colorado and yeah. Oregon and elsewhere. So that was kind of awesome. But I mean, really, I think if we really set our minds to it, we could probably come up with maybe. 10 specific things in the last 100 years that have been cut i mean that's <laughs> they're still what? they're still giving subsidies for sh uh, to sheep farmers for uniforms for the korean war so yeah yeah and yeah and the, and the, and that, that's and how hopeless not. government is <laughs> and, the, and, and that's deal. how hopeless politics is right exactly but, but what a pack of lies the american people believe <laughs> I mean, can you imagine, like right now, as we're speaking, there's a big debate between going on between which Democrat should get the nomination, and then <laughs> and then how this falls out. It's going to be like, well, should the Democrats do the Republicans win? It's not even clear that it matters at all. But everybody buys into this baloney because maybe they you can't handle the truth. Maybe that's what's going on. You know? <laughs> I think it's, it's like, the, the futility. They look at it as like this giant mountain in the background. They're like, I'll never climb that. And not realizing the only way to win is just turn around and walk away. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Yeah. But it's good. It's it's interesting to think about these subjects and and um I'm I'm fascinated about the you know the the difference between the reality of government and the public perceptions. You know, it's just like this vast gulf. <laughs> Uh, yeah, difference. it is. I mean, it's a big divide. I mean, I mean, look, why don't we learn? I mean, Obama, do you remember? Uh, maybe you don't. Obama was elected like, whatever, seven years ago or something. First time. And people were really talking like heaven was going to come to earth. Yep. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. hope and change. It was all going to happen. And here we are, you know, all these years later, it's the same old shit. And yet people still maintain the hope. Oh, well, it's because we need the Sanders. You know, whatever. It's like. It's um yeah yeah that and, and earlier you were talking about Obama or not Obama but Trump uh and his stance on the second amendment you know uh the other day I was talking with some friends and we were talking about how presidents say one thing and do the opposite if you look at what George Bush had said during his campaigns Obama they do the complete opposite so if we get Trump in there couldn't we expect him to do the complete opposite of everything he said would there wouldn't be there would be open borders in Mexico there would be Muslims everywhere and <laughs> I don't know. Guns I mean, would I be banned. No clue, I have no clue what a Trump presidency would look like. And and here I have been. I've written like you know eighty articles against Trump, and yet I find myself sort of weirdly sad that that his chances of getting the nomination are, are, are gone. Because I mean, part of me is like really weirdly curious about what. I don't think they're happen. gone, man. I think you're. I think you're underestimating quite. <laughs> He's maybe. at forty percent in New Hampshire. Forty percent. Maybe, maybe I don't know. And he, did, know, he didn't I, even I, caucus I in Iowa. I'm not. I'm not a Trump fan or a supporter. I don't want a president. I am a voluntarist. I do not want any president. But Trump is. I don't know how Trump doesn't blow the doors off this. I said yesterday on Facebook, all Trump needs to do is have a conveniently staged Muslim attack on him, where he looks like a badass. And like shoots down a Muslim or something, instant presidency, and instant, you watch, you've been instant. What is that? Unanimous. This is the Putin, the Putin on a bear thing. I mean, come on, give me a break. It's man. basically think, Putin man. on a bear. Do you understand what that would do to the people? These Muslims tried to attack me. Well, no, that, and then boom, that, see, he pop, dude, it's no, over, that, that, over, election over. You might that, as well not that, even run. As much as the American That's how population. stupid America it is. That no, listen, Oh, no. yes it is. No, it would it no, something like Jeremy, that. we stay yeah. on echo, echo chambers all day on the internet. Trust me, America the is quite like this. No, the the Republican base, sure. The people the the people that hate every single Muslim and and collectivize them and think that they, you know, that everybody who's ever um even considered looking at a Quran as this evil person, yeah, it would get them up in a heartbeat, absolutely. But it would polarize the people that already hate him. Even they would find a way, because the 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 re I mean, the reason people keep doing this and they keep playing that they they keep going through the dance is because, like I said earlier, they have very short attention spans. And even when you have somebody like Obama, where we can all sit here and point to, we can say, look, he promised all these things. 
none of them, were, like pretty much nothing happened. Not a single one of these hope and change things came through. Why don't they recognize that and go, well, holy crap, we were lied to? Because even if they recognize that he failed, their confirmation bias hasn't changed. No, they don't so they, 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 still watch, they still watch the same news shows. They still read the same newspapers or the same, or the same websites who all spin everything the way that needs to be spun. Oh, the Republicans, were, the, the Republicans were getting in the way. The Republicans stopped us from doing this. I mean, that went on for how long? I mean, how long did they spend the first four and a half years blaming Bush? That's all they did. Yeah. Everything that but, came up, it was Bush. It oh, was, we're just facing granted, Bush's granted, problems. Granted, he Everybody granted can't. he did a lot of bad things, but it wasn't like just, it was just that we, it was like it was like the it was like the leftist scream of racist. That's all it was. It was just nope, Bush. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your Bush sign. It's, so, you're right. I forgot. So <laughs> you said you wanted to go around an hour. We're getting close. We got five minutes. I want okay. you to give five minutes to anybody who's disillusioned right now because Rand dropped out. I won't oh, yeah? say a word. I just will let you speak for five minutes, I, and I, I want to hear. Wow, you know. So look, I have a, a slight Rand problem in the sense that, like, <laughs> I've been friend, friends with this guy since he was like twenty-three years old. You know, I used to hang out with him in backyard barbecues and stuff. You know, so I know him. I think he's earnest. I think he's brilliant, actually, um, and I'm kind of weirdly proud of him as my friend for getting as far as he's gotten in politics. And and I sort of admire, it's very interesting about Rand. You know, he's not like us. You know, all of us are like, you know, cynical and beaten down and fed up with everything. He still thinks that, that there's a chance that he can use politics to affect uh, change for the good. And, you know... As much as I'd like to think I'm right about everything, I like reserve part of me thinks that, well, give it a try. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to take that away from him. And I think what happened to him was kind of weirdly tragic this time. I mean, he ran for, ran for president, and you know, he knew that by just being a pure libertarian, he couldn't get above 8 13% of support for uh, Republicans from the Republicans, because those are the libertarians like us, I guess. At least it was last go around. And so he kind of broadened his message out, and, and we all saw it as pandering, right? So suddenly he's like, you know, a little bit more favorable to intervent foreign intervention, is like sucking up to the Christian right, and we're like throwing tomatoes at him and stuff like that. And, and then, then his support goes down, and he never picked up, you know, uh, the people he hoped to pick up. And so it kind of worked again. He was like eaten from two directions. And then Trump happened. And I think that was sort of the end of Rand. And I, you know what I think? If you want to know what I really think, here's what I really yes. think. I think that Rand was so demoralized personally as a man and as a thinker, as an intellectual, as an activist. He was so demoralized by the success of Trump that he kind of lost heart. I mean, he just, he asked himself, do I really want the nomination of this party? that's going all for this jerk. I mean, I, th I think he became a little supercilious, you know? And you could see it in his eyes in the debate. He was like, oh, God, you know? I mean, he didn't even seem to be, like, engaged. He was like, oh, Jesus, you know? I mean, there was a sense of, like, disengagement. And I, that's, that's my sense. Like, I think he knew that he lost the nomination uh, early in the fall, but he stuck with it through the first primary because he felt like he had an obligation to his donors. I, I, I think it's the, the whole thing. Yeah. But I don't think it's, it, it's, it's I, I mean, I don't, I don't think any of us should be demoralized by this, really. I mean, the cause of liberty is more alive than ever. What I don't think that we have entirely recognized, I'm speaking probably for myself more than anything else, is that in these late days of statism, I don't think we fully realized how perfectly ridiculous everything would become before the thing fell apart. And I think that's what we're living through right now is the absurdification of the political system. And I, this is going to continue for another 10 years or something until until the peer-to-peer technology and digital technology and everything else just like makes the state irrelevant. But in the meantime, lots of terrible shit's going to happen. And I, think I don't that think was, Grant I, belongs there. 
I, I don't think Rand belongs there either. Either, and I, and I was really glad to see him drop out because if he would have won or would have gotten close to winning, uh, it would it wouldn't have looked good for what is con- he's considered to be a libertarian just because of his dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. if if he would have won the the the, in, the incoming economic collapse that is coming for the for America is. It wouldn't be good for that to fall onto a uh, yeah, what, supposedly and, free market kind of guy. Right, and what we talked about Khrushchev and Trump, like, can they really control the system? Well, Rand couldn't control the system either. Imagine if he were president. Jesus, can you imagine? I mean, if he I did anything that. worthwhile, they would kill him. If no, they it was par for the course, <laughs> the system would roll along, and he would look like a bumbling idiot the whole time, like Obama. Yes, he's probably better off being senator. And actually, I think he's doing some good as senator. And I gather he was—he's got something of a struggle now to get reelected. Right? I've been but, really so. hard on Rand for like the last—I don't know—week, but I've been yeah. mainly harder on people that have pushed Rand up on this pedestal as some kind of liberty god. Hmm. And he's just a man, you know. He's yeah. just a guy, and he just yeah, happens to be in politics. He's his own man, and. Mm-hmm. He he doesn't have to be a carbon copy of his father. He just doesn't have to be. He's got to make his own decisions, make his own judgments, right or wrong. He's his own man. So uh, I think in 2020, I think, I think if the economy goes down with either Sanders, Clinton, or Trump, or Cruz, or it, one of those guys, the economy goes down, I hope the people will start buying into the idea that maybe this thing should be abolished. Yeah. When people can't afford to pass in their car to go to work, it's going to start waking people up. There's probably going to be another round of 2008. I'm just, I'm not looking forward to that. It's just going to be grim. I mean, you know, this 2008, I mean, I hope you like it. I feel like I've learned a lot in 2015. And I've learned to distrust democratic politics more than I ever have before. I mean, that's my takeaway from the last. I mean, months. America is teetering on fascism. I, all it would take is two or three false flags, like really well false flags, and it's over. And everyone knows it. The state is in such control right now that it's in, it's insane. They're watching this call right now. They're probably listening on my cell phone over here as well. Yeah, there's an element of desperation to the state at this point. You know, I mean, really, we've got we've got cryptography, we've got we've got a, a emergence of, of of Bitcoin, we've got peer to peer technology going crazy, destroying monopolies all over the place. I mean, we're really at a precipice. You know, we can go one way or the other. And, I said last and, night we need an Uber for um, arbitration, and this thing's over. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks guys for hanging out. Yeah, no, this was awesome. great. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. I enjoyed just I winging it. It was fun. Where, where, where am I going to see you next? ISFLC? Are you going? Are you going? To, to uh, Liberty Fest? No, well, I'm going to be. I'm going to be at Liberty Fest this next year. But I was thinking about the International Students for Liberty Conference. That's one. Liberty Fest, Freedom Fest. Those are my big events. Um, I've got a couple of YALs to do. But anyway, I look forward to seeing you in, in person the next time. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I would love to go to Anarcopulco as well. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of great people. I'm sure. Are you going to this? I, I wanted to, but there were three competing events, and I finally had to just make the tough choice of. Uh, <laughs> oh, <clears throat> oh no, the market, the market demanded that. <laughs> Jeffrey Tucker's supply was low. There was a high demand. Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> thanks for having me tonight, guys. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, do you want to go ahead and plug anything, and we'll we'll close out? No, well, yeah, we can go, uh, join Liberty Me, all right? It's, it's <laughs> an awesome community. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you don't want to do that, well, you should do that. But then you should also go to fee.org, which is where I'm building every day. And Love Fee. Yeah, it's a, Love it. It's a, it's a 70-year-old organization, and it's going well. Wow. So I'm not unhappy. Yeah, we had, um, uh, we had Lawrence Ruby on the show also, and uh, he's a great guy. Yeah, wonderful conversation. He's awesome. He's he's my boss, and he's my original mentor on this He's world. a very well-spoken so, gentleman. Wow. I like it. I met him when I was 20 years old. So <laughs> wow. I love Larry. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I always ask every new guest, uh, what's your favorite quote? And we will get out of here. Oh, wow, my favorite quote, uh, yeah, from maybe Albert J. Nock, who said, um, who said, God damn it, I don't remember what he said. Um, <laughs> That's uh, a great quote. <laughs> he said, people say, uh, uh, pe- people call me uh, uneven-tempered, it's not true. I have very even temper. I'm mad all the time. Uh, 
So. <laughs> well said, well said. I think that's very similar to what your quote of your podcast is. <laughs> there you go. Nice. All right. To wrap us up, Danilo. There is an internal anger. Yes. I know it doesn't seem like it, but it's true. <laughs> it's thanks, um, awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thanks, up, thanks a lot, Jerry, um, uh, Jeffrey, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Please, I'll, everyone. I'll uh, do it again. Invite me back anytime. And thank you for doing this podcast. You're, you're doing good things for the cause. We try. Right. <laughs> we try. Right. Thanks a lot. Right. Anybody, thanks, wants, anybody wants to help us out, please donate uh, Bitcoin uh, or Patreon. Uh, <laughs> Patreon.com slash uh, Seeds of Liberty to help us out. Uh, we love doing this. We want to do more. So We got a new thanks. subscriber on Patreon. Let me holler at this dude real quick. Where is it at? Where are you at, Patreon? There it is. Um, uh, Miriam, thank you so much for your $5 pledge. Really helps out. Yes. Thank you very much, Miriam. So, wonderful conversation. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, so, uh, this is Season Liberty Podcast. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Peace. Peace. to call us utopians, they're actually projecting their own self-hatred onto us.